Hi everyone, this is Duncan from the podcast Under the Stairs. This particular video you're checking out just now has the archival recording attached to it. The archival recording is from our podography, I think that's the term that we use, um, and it will feature reviews of movies that fall under the 88 Films Italian Collection series. Now, the vast majority of reviews we've done over the last five years have been in audio format and published on our RSS feed for the podcast. We are transitioning over to give you access to all those reviews right here on YouTube under a playlist. Now, we're doing that because we're about to do our first video recording of E88 Films Italian collection release, that being Tentacles. So there's plenty of opportunity to delve into the back catalogue of the reviews here. And if you like what you hear, then please hit subscribe on the channel, leave your comments below, and uh, check out the rich catalogue of over 1,200 episodes we have on podcasts under the stairs on any podcatching device or Spotify that you use. So stick around, enjoy the episode, and I'll speak to you very soon. Welcome back. So you've just heard the trailer for disc number 29 of the 88 Films Italian Collection series. This is Delirium. Some information about this movie from 1987. So this is late day Italian horror fair, considering the, the genre or the climate as we knew it would be all but gone like in the next four years after this. So... Uh, the 88 Films website says this about the movie. Gloria, played by Serena Grandi of Anthropopicus the Beast, a model turned magazine owner is having a terrible time of keeping her buxom talent alive. A crazed fan of the ex-model is picking off her new starlets one by one and sending grotesque photographs of their bloody craftsmanships to the poor mogul. As the threats and bodies continue to mount, Gloria must discover who the madman is before she becomes the ultimate model for this lunatic's chopping block. Scored by the legendary Simon Boswell of Demons 2, Lumberto Bava's overly stylish giallo was originally developed by none other than Dario Argento and is brimming with legendary exploitation stars like Daria Nicolodi, George Eastman and David Brandom, all of whom are draped in outlandish 80s fashion. Delirium makes its HD debut thanks to 88 films and is a must-have for any Giallo fan. The special features on this one, it contains both the Blu-ray and DVD versions. It also has a newly master restore from the original camera negatives. It has a booklet, uh, with notes by Callum Waddle on Daria Nicolodi, The Dame of Delirium, newly credited English subtitles and a reversible sleeve with the original Lee Photo de Gloria title. Uh, technical specs, it's a region locked Blu-ray uh, for UK and Europe, so it's region B, uh, and the DVD is region 2. Picture format HD 1080p, um, it's 185 one widescreen audio format is LPCM stereo, Dolby digital stereo, um, the language is English and the movie is about an hour and a half long. Um, this was the first time watched for me as we have found while doing this series, Lamberto Bava appears to be a weak spot for me. I didn't realise the man was as active 
as he appears to have been, particularly um, in the in the eighties. This guy put out a ton of fucking stuff that I've never seen. So, like you, you put me forward a scenario where Lamberto Bava is is finishing something that Ar- Dario Argento has started, and then you give me George Eastman, and I'm like, swing. And then you give me Daria Nickelodeon, like, swing, swing. Then you give me Simon Boswell, scoring up, swing, swing, swing. I'm in. I'm in for this one. Um, later day Jallo is, is kind of, and when I say later day, I mean later, later day. So later day Jallo is really kind of late 70s. And then everything beyond that is kind of late to the party Jallo. And you get little, little sousons of, um, of Jallo awesomeness that kind of creep in here and there. But for the most part, the 80s stuff starts to become... L- I was going to say highly derivative, but that's a lot of the 70s stuff. It becomes more influenced by um, the slasher than it necessarily does by being a kind of proto-slasher influence. So, Jallos come out, they do what they do. American directors see them at the grindhouse in the 70s, get inspired. They start doing their version, which becomes a slasher genre in the early 80s, which has a similar life cycle to the Jallo, uh, in that they both mimic each other almost perfectly in terms of uh, the influx of them, how long they last, and then how quickly they dissipate. And then you get the Italians swinging in with their sort of stuff, which is like a kind of hybrid Jallo slasher, which you get in things like Tenebrae, for example, or A Blade in the Dark, which we discussed feels like a couple of weeks ago, but I think it's months ago. Um, and Delirium certainly feels like a return back to kind of Jallo standards in that there is a gloved killer um, who we do not see, who, is a pe- who appears to be dressed up in some sort of outfit and uh, they are murdering people close to a central person who may or may not have the key information uh, in which to solve this case. Now, what I will say about this is th- the big thing that surprised me with Delirium was by kind of later standards, the gore is nowhere near as vicious as A Blade in the Dark, uh, which came out, what, five, six years before, but uh, Bava like was really leaning into that vicious streak. In fact, I said on here that between that and Tenebrae, I think you could make an argument for w- which is the bloodiest Jallo ever made. Um, both of them had like these really fucking mean streaks that Delirium doesn't necessarily have. It seems to ramp back on that, and I don't know how much of that is a product of the time that it came out. Kind of late 80s censorship across the board is clamping down. I'll tell you what they did not censor in this movie. Boobies. Holy Jesus Christ, the nudity is off the chart. Um, All the way through this movie, it's tits galore. Um, Everywhere you look, tits. Any opportunity for a woman to get a rack out, she gets her rack out. Um, and uh, Gloria, played by Serena Grandi, oh dear God almighty, uh, Grandi by name, Grandi by nature, uh, when it comes to those uh, chebbage, holy fuck, it's a set of melons and a half, beautiful woman, um, and dear God almighty, does she have a rack and a half, um, and I don't want to just lean into that, she's actually really good, I, t- I tell you this about this movie, uh, almost across the board entirely, the acting is of a higher calibre than you would expect a movie like this. If I compare this to something like Argento's Opera, which is about the same time, um, this boasts maybe better acting performances across the board than Argento's Opera has. And I think a lot of that leads down to the fact that Argento just really isn't interested in what his actors and actresses are doing. He's just interested in the shot where you get the feeling that um, Bava being friends with people like George Eastman, obviously knowing Dar- Daria Nicolodi, has cast this well and leaned into it well. Um, there are shades in here which you can see have been developed by an Argento. Um, just some of the kill sets are very much in that in that level. But the movie has a goofy kind of twist to the over the top killings in the movie, which I, I see over the top, you're thinking gory and all the rest. It's just the set pieces are kind of ridiculous. That it kind of feels like Bava's at the helm here. If you've watched a lot of Bava stuff, uh, which I am definitely doing as part of this series, you start to find that things pivot to the more surreal and the more extreme, which um, is definitely uh, Lambero Bava's um, as his uh, playground for for mayhem. So what you have here is, and and the kind of wider scape is this. This woman who was some sort of, I'm going to say, 
maybe a glamour model. I, I can't quite go into that, although there are insinuations that that's where she turns. So this model gets this magazine. She kind of, her and her brother take it from relative obscurity to this powerhouse, uh, which really appears to be focused around her. She does a lot of modelling in it. She's returned to the camera, so to speak, and um, she's very quick to take off her clothes, all of them, and get into these ridiculous kind of poses, which would make this magazine sell very well. Um, her brother is a cameraman, so he's designing all the shots, and very quickly you get this idea of there's maybe this kind of unhealthy environment between brother and sister. It's certainly kind of lecherous if you're watching it it, it seems to lean that way um, what you then have is over a short period of time because she's getting back into it we find out that her like mother, adopted mother, someone is trying to buy her out trying to buy out the rights, she's not happy with the direction of her, her uh, child or her prodigy or whatever it is has went, I don't think they actually fully swing into whether or not she was her manager or her mother I may be forgetting that aspect now. But she's trying to buy her out. And she's resisting. Gloria doesn't want to sell. And then all her models start to die in weird circumstances. With this kind of thing where the killer is seeing them as almost alien. This is not explained in the movie to the best of my knowledge. Unless I miss something here. This is definitely not explained why when the killer looks at them. The killer sees them wearing masks. So in the first and probably most infamous death. The model is wearing an eyeball for a head. And it's this fucking insane alien eyeball mask. And she gets a, a prowler style death with a, a pitchfork right in the gut. Um, later on a woman has a kind of bug head. And she is uh, stung to death by by wasps or bees or something. Not the bees! Digital bees! Well, this isn't digital bees, which is thankful. Um, but at the same time, terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. Uh, her brother dies. Um, we don't get to see his death. His death is off screen, which to me is the wink, wink, nudge, nudge about what the reveal is going to be in this movie. If you're if you're au fait with how these movies usually play out, if you get a death off screen and then the body disappears, chances are something weird is going to happen. But all these bodies are dying and then what they're doing is they're being staged in front of like a photo shoot in front of a large picture of Gloria and then sent to Gloria. Uh, she's obviously at this point considering that her position as as magazine owner is unattainable um, and she wants to get, she wants to GTFO right out of where she is and go back to a much simpler life by selling off her magazine. Now, the only details we get, and there's a, another big twist coming here, because far be it from this movie to be conventional, with no nods towards Hitchcock, we get this whole kind of rear window sort of scenario where there's a boy who is obsessed with Gloria. I say boys, maybe late teens, early 20s, um, who's confined to a wheelchair, but we find out that this might be psychologically confined to the wheelchair and not physically. And he has been observing... Um, Pervin mostly, but observing these deaths from his balcony, which is um, the adjacent property, overseeing the grounds of, of where the crime is happening. So he's away up there, he's seen all this shit, he's phoning up, and then what we find out is the killer appears to have blonde hair, this kind of long flown blonde hair. So as a result of that, any of our models could be a potential red herring, but you can discount that because this is a jalo, which means that none of them are likely to be it. Then you get the feeling that maybe it's Daria Nicolodi because she's got blonde hair and maybe she could be it. And she disappears towards the end of the movie. She, like has the most un unceremonious leaving of a movie considering Daria Nicolodi might be your biggest star in this movie. Particularly for an Italian audience. Just her pedigree, her involvement with Argento and all the rest. She's like the household name. And she just disappears from this movie. Like she leaves a, a kind of Dear John letter and then fucks off. Um, so you're like kind of maybe... It's her, but once again, you're thinking it's not her because you know what you, you know what you know. Then you're thinking, well, George Eastman's in this movie. George Eastman usually plays evil guys for the most part in these movies. Once again, obvious red herring. And the movie trundles on, trundles on, trundles on, and what we find out right at the very end is it's none other than her brother, the brother that we thought was dead wasn't actually dead at all. He staged his death. Because he is not only a crazed fan, but he fucking loves her. He wants to stick his dick in between those big old titties. 
Um, sorry, get graphic, but that's kind of what he starts to rather horribly force her to undress. Uh, and we think we're going to get us some rapey rape rape and then the movie kind of stops that and she uh, she manages to kill dispatch her brother just in the nick of time and then the movie kind of ends with her and um, well we see she dispatch her brother and kills she doesn't she confines her brother to a wheelchair um so her brother's still alive but confined to this wheelchair for life yo and uh, she sold her magazine so she's now rich and she's in a hospital and then creepy little stalker fucking perv kid comes in and then they have this kind of flirty moment and then the movie ends and I'm wholly confused but I've seen stranger endings um, in this subgenre and uh, yeah the movie finishes and then we're, we're done mic drop, cut to credits uh, so yeah that's Delirium you can probably tell in the tone of my voice, I am. I'm in two minds in this movie. Uh, I think there's a lot to like about it. I think the the Simon Boswell score is fucking great. Shades of kind of quirkier John Carpenter, for sure, in here. And if you've checked out Demons Two, you'll know that that guy can score him some movies. And I quite like the the kind of bava touch at times the guy is clearly a master of his craft he clearly picked up a lot of tips and tricks from the environment he grew up in and being surrounded by some of the greatest filmmakers ever on the planet but his great gifts are also his great curses and that he sometimes i feel kind of feels the need to go a bit too goofy and it, it takes me out there is a really interesting story in here it's slightly different from the usual fare that you would see in a kind of giallo movie. Once again, I love the ones that deal with the kind of fashion industry. That's where they were birthed out of, and he's kind of returning back to that. Albeit this movie really, really, really does want to just get women naked as much as possible. And that is not necessarily a negative against the movie. It's just very obvious the balance towards nudity over, over kind of violence is definitely weighted in the nudity side. Um, performances are okay. I mean, for the most part, there's the 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 big names in this movie do well. Um, the the for the most part, even uh, Serena Grande manages to portray fear in a way which I think is kind of cool. Um, and the movie trundles on at a good pace. It's an hour and a half. It doesn't labour its point. Gets in, gets out pretty quick. Um, but I don't know. It finished, and I just kind of felt that it wasn't necessarily lackluster, but. You can tell this was the kind of that we're on the, the the death nails of the genre at this point. We are slowly trundling out in the decade and uh, into a decade where these filmmakers just won't have a presence. And I, I mean, I'll give it his credit. Uh, Bava feels like he is putting his all into this project, where a lot of directors at this time period, and I'm looking at you, Lucio Fulci. And to an extent, you are gentle. Uh, I do love opera, but let's not forget you fucking shat the bed uh, quite heavily. Within a couple of years of this, you just started doing some shitty, shitty movies. Um, that when I look at it, I see that when you look at something like Mikel Suave's stuff, you can see where he was going and he was taking this really, it was this really exciting new voice and Lambero Bava is not that long, he's about a decade into his career and he already kind of feels a bit tired, like he's labouring points that have already been kind of kind of surpassed. I think that's where I come down on it, I think it is a wholly entertaining movie, I, I think you'll get a lot of fun watching it, I don't know how much of a necessity this is if you are like a Jallo fan. Um, I think it, it definitely feels more Americanized than some of the other ones. I think it has some issues at times just not giving you what fans want to see, which is the out and out gore, the violence yeah. is just not here. Um, that being said, it's still fun. The, it's obvious who the red hair is. It's uh, really, if you haven't picked it up by about the 35 minute mark, then you're not doing your job and you haven't seen enough of these movies. Um, and yeah, so while the movie itself flies by at a pace, it's kind of forgettable. I get the feeling that, that I, like a year from now, if you ask me about Delirium, one, I'm going to forget Lambert Obama directed it, and two, I'm going to forget some details. I won't forget like the infamous kills of the movie, for sure, but just a lot of the details himself 
just aren't here and it's just not as stylish the style the cinematography is just not quite here in this movie um, I have been off work ill and I've been going through a ton of like kind of um, early to late 70s giallo from some of the masters of the craft uh, Massimo Del Mano um, Sergio Martino um, uh, Luciano Ercoli and you know going through these guys work and seeing that even when the stories are a bit meh, and the pacing's a bit meh, the movies themselves are like fucking paintings come to life and this movie just don't don't feel like that don't feel like that at all so yeah I'm at my grade for this one it's a three and a half I, I did still enjoy it and to be honest with you if you once again stack this movie against most of the ones I've seen thus far in the slasher classics, this is better. I mean, it just it appears that even on a slumming day for an Italian crew, they managed to put out something which is far more entertaining than their, than their American counterparts. So yeah, that said, Delirium, three and a half out of five. Like I say, wouldn't necessarily go rushing out to check it out, uh, but it is worth a watch, a one-time watch. Um, if you are old school Jallo fan, you're probably not going to enjoy this one. It just it, it it doesn't have the class of those movies. I will say about this one, I do not know what happened here, but um, the special features pretty shitty on this one. I did really enjoy the book, uh, um, the the notes on uh, Daria Nicolodi. That's I mean that's great. Cam Waddle clearly knows his shit. He's clearly a very well educated and very knowledgeable cinephile. Um, who has a passion for this part of the world and he definitely gives it there but no interviews um, no audio commentaries where there's, I mean I know for like Lambert Bava still alive so I don't know what's going on with that um, but yeah, kind of light on the, the special features the print though was excellent really enjoyed the print, they obviously they did, the, they did their due diligence there so there we go, that's disc number 29 of the 88 Films Italian Collection Series Delirium. I wonder where we're going next.